this week on Hermitcraft. Welcome to the first meeting. Uh, if okay, you die, good. it's all over. Welcome to the Hermitcraft recap. My name is Pixel Riffs. Our writer is Loy XP, and with all these mechanical spiders and giant eagles invading the server lately, it was inevitable they'd try to form the Megazord sooner or later. By their powers combined, Botum Town has laid out their aim for the server's first gigabase, so expect it to be the size of 1024 megabases. We joke, but at the pace things are going, this honestly feels like something they would do. I mean, they've got to have something to do once the game of Teg is over, and it nearly is! The latest scoreboard in Grian's episode shows the participants drawing ever closer to the 500 point finish line. But it's still anybody's game, so before the final whistle is blown on this egg and spoon race, let's take a look at all the events and mishaps that occurred on the Hermitcraft server this week. Starting with B00, who might be one of the last people to see Botum Town before it assembles the Voltron, although it'll have to wait until he comes back with diamonds. I have no diamonds. <laughs> Do I have no diamonds for real? Oh no! Having bought a handful of hot rods, B-dubs brews up and grabs his snorkel hat for a dive, Also, he can remove some brain coral from its natural habitat and use it as a path block. It seems the coral might get its revenge in the form of ZF, but you'll have to watch the video or wait until next week's recap for that one. In the meantime, the aforementioned path leads around the Big Eyes Crew's pet mountain and up onto a freshly terraformed cliff, around which they plan to build a scenic coastal town as a one-stop shop for all the server's resource needs. B-dubs is already trying to discourage the competition by roughing up the swagon and nicking the tires. Yeah! <laughs> the sizable Oculus crew gets more muscle to back them up when Tango Tech finally reveals what roams within the B-dubs mountain. It's Tango. Tango roams there, but he also has a tendency to build enormous cyclopses, so that may be a problem for anyone up to oppose them. Oh, oh. disgusting! <laughs> so now we have um, someone living in the cave. <laughs> the hulking brute with the biggest eye of all is christened Fifi, and will serve as the centerpiece to the Hall of the Mountain King, especially since he is evidently too big to fit through the door. This complex organic took all of Tango's tan-coloured blocks, including rooted dirt, which is notoriously awful to farm even if he automates half the process. There we go. That, that. No, I keep crushing my thing. The granite, however, took a deal with the horse heads. Hypnotized and XB crafted didn't mind giving away large amounts of resources. Granted, their marketplace by now functions like Fiverr, but with even more life debt. Fair I'm getting mixed vibes here. What, now, what, what, what it's fine, you? it's fine. It's just legal jargon. Everybody does it. Uh, it is interesting then that Hypno jumps into organic building as well, though his blocks are his to farm. It must have rained something fierce on the server for this many mushrooms to pop up, and Hypnotized shapes them into an amazing Amanita towering over the Shroom Village. And against all odds, he is actually happy with living in the irregular shaped red cap, thinking it will provide a sufficient building challenge to keep things interesting. Uh, so that's a thing that I definitely wanted a base like this for. Something that was a little bit more chaotic and not predictable where things go. While the IOUs are racking up over at Horsehead Farms, XB Crafted still has personal business to take care of, and observing Corallis' flair for interior design, he pays for all of the glass with a diamond block desk. Said glass has been put to use in his massive wasteland biodome, which is now airtight but far from complete. After adding more structural elements to the dome's exterior, XB nests a second dome inside of the first, like the yolk inside of an egg if the yolk was made of slate and glass and was holding up a terrarium garden. Oh, look at it! Even from outside, it looks freaking awesome! If you're wondering where the landscape went, most of it was sold to Impulse, who's happy to sign any amount of ominous IOUs if it means he has more space to build his enormous factory. Um, yeah, it's gonna be producing some waste, and yeah, we got this little back area. While the foundations are still being laid, he gets a tour of the fresh interior Wells Knight and Gemini Tay put together for the Yes Wings Clubhouse. Wells puts Impulse in charge of human resources, the place needs some staff after all, and Impulse stretches the definition of human by recruiting two librarians, a drowned with a stylish hat to run the front desk, and a pair of wither skeletons who are good at making cocktails if the main ingredient is you. Yeah, and that's a nice height for him too. This is why it was nice to have a taller mob behind the bar, because we're going to sink him down with the snow, and then he is perfect height. He also installs a place you can dance away your troubles. We just hope the more zealous aviators don't mistake the flashing lights for a landing strip. Though Wells Knight admits he doesn't much do interiors, the team of him and Gemini Tay are capable enough to make the Wings Club look like a lived-in facility, strangling a llama notwithstanding. Today I learned that wandering traders can 
pull their llamas through floors. Quite effectively, what? too. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> Jem's expertise in structure building is challenged as well when her base towers reach their peak, or rather don't, because she didn't know how to do the roof on this one right away. Still, she conquers the shingles and grants the build the name Woodland Palace. Here's hoping the illagers don't take that as their cue to move in. As you can see, everyone, I've got the roofs started. There's still some details on this one especially that's needed, and the walls on this are obviously not detailed because they're still just flat. So this is the point in the script when we find out that most of the women from Hermitcraft are basically the Jigsaw Killer. <laughs> the event in question is the Teg, and now that the scores are so close, the stakes are higher than ever. Thus, Pearlescent Moon's labyrinth of trials and puzzles actually has Jem take a step back and reconsider. It's no wonder, Pearl's Corridor of Carnage starts as a labyrinth of doors, which is a tried and true rage game, goes on to a powdered snow puzzle room and concludes with a parkour course over boiling lava. However, in the time it takes for Jem to catch her breath and have a tea break, False Symmetry blazes through the whole thing and runs off with the Teg, though admittedly not very far. Wait, how am I meant to get back to the locker room? Where my stuff? Ah! 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 No! Well, Pearl should have lit up the Teg area. Naturally, having been through it all, False wasn't just going to hide the trophy the usual way. Instead, she puts together a trivia game where each room offers you a question and several doors marked with the answer to it. Guess correctly enough times and you end up with the most expensive omelette on the server. Guess incorrectly enough times, you end up in the hospital. We did it! She didn't say calculator. That's not breaking the rules. Yeah. We, we can use calculator. I know this one straight away. Jem braves the riddles, though uses up a lifeline and phones a pearl just so it's not as lonely. From her, the Teg finds its way to Grian, and not being a murder woman of Hermitcraft, he just tries to sell it for diamonds. Now, if the Hermits aren't willing to pay five diamonds for the Teg, then I win more than five diamonds, so it's pretty much a win-win from this point. And it's gone. Eventually, the Teg winds up in the hands of Joe Hills, although first he has to conclude his tour of his server mate's starter houses. And even though Grian wasn't around to give him the tour, the house decided to troll Joe anyway. Not only does Joe fall down a hole behind a painting, but Pearlescent Moon also dies trying to help him recover his items. Once they've retrieved everything except the book Joe was taking notes in, a creeper arrives to blow up the floor and some of Grian's storage. Joe rushes to fix it, but gets attacked by a zombie that didn't render on his screen, then a horde of other zombies start pouring in from outside. The whole debacle ends with Joe leaving an apologetic bouquet of flowers and booking it. He later tries to help Scar out of a similar situation, which it turns out was also Grian's fault, but eventually gets a win by straight up buying the Teg from Grian's train. We now have a dragon egg. Woo! Bum, 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 bum. Bum, 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 bum. Wait, that's not the next generation theme. At which point he reveals he's built a starter house, packed full of all the features he's been taking notes on as he toured the server. The only thing he does not reveal is where he hid the Teg. In a striking contrast, Cubfan makes a powdered snow puzzle for his server mates to die in without having the Teg anywhere near it. The pit in which you freeze is actually a powdered snow shop named Cool Corner, and the solution to the puzzle of Frostbite is that it's a shoes off shop, but they do offer slippers. And we see this guy here says, take leather boots, return to the barrel outside the shop. So we do just that, we take the boots, we put them on, uh, we can now walk around and we won't freeze anymore. Quite a contrast to the rest of his architecture, which is like stepping on a Lego. Empowered by the pointed dripstone farm, Cub continues to spread his upwards cone biome, with custom music no less. Bum 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 Mr. Cubben. Cub me it Ben. Cub me the greatest Cub 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 Ben. Hilariously, he's not even the only person to try for an a cappella, as Grian does his own music for his time lapse too. Do will train, do 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 will train. His justification is that the building of the will train cart for the G train time lapse is too short and simple not to just hum over. The strategy of spamming the terrain with non full blocks comes in handy for I Jevin. This week he tackles a wither skeleton farm, and what better way to court the spawn rate into the Nether Fortress? crossroads, then covering the whole of the nether in buttons. Once the biome is bumpy enough, the farm starts spewing wither skulls like nobody's business, plus the old trick with spawning a wither boss headfirst in bedrock means Jevin has beacons out the wazoo and wither boss skulls to boot. Well, we are now the proud owner of 54 nether stars, 
and a bunch of different types of wither heads. It's a good thing he's diversifying, because another shulker box giant is clambering into view. After Doc M's shulker farm arrived last week, he took to decorating it as a giant crab walking robot with a giant glowing eye. And while the Breath of the Wild fans are getting their shields ready to deflect, he's putting shulker boxes inside shulker boxes. Well, at least the shells are being packaged up and ready to ship out across the server. <laughs> so those are all filled up at the moment. Here, um, those we still have to run through the system. Amazing deals ahead. <laughs> but Doc's plan isn't to make shulker boxes available for cheap. He prices them competitively, but he wants repeat customers after all. And he makes the pop-up shops worth a visit, not just by building them as more four-legged walkers, but by concealing a winning ticket for some kind of grand prize inside just one of the three stacks of shulker boxes. We figured if anyone was going to give out golden tickets, it was going to be Impulse, but Doc M has surprised us once again. Evil Azuma, in the meantime, has discovered the art of emotional manipulation. Exactly how the Shivering Striders factor into his scheme of the month remains a mystery, but we do know that Shivering Hoglins connect to regular Azuma Void's plans. Since Zoglins attack everything in sight, Azuma decides to use them as the knocking down agent for a witch farm, as in, they literally knock the witches off the spawning platforms. His other dealings are much nicer, even quaint by comparison, Azuma continues to expand the Alpen village he calls home, and gets into the architecture of it one street at a time. The next thing we're going to do is put on those roofs, and look at that. It's getting there, it's slowly getting there. You should also check out the view from right here, it's really cool actually. A different kind of mountain dwelling takes shape in the shattered savannah, where Iskel85 has recruited a fisherman, and decides he'll spend the rest of his life looking out of a porthole. This definitively non-hobbity home ends up housing several fishermen, including Iskel himself, who tries to catch a fish from absurd heights in one of his riptide pools. Sight, yes! Oh! It's not a fish, it's a bone, we gotta do it again. While restocking his supply of guardian blocks, he comes up with the idea of casually adding a sea lantern switch to Etho's control panel just to see if he notices, but he also gets an offer from Vintage Beef, who wants a bulk order of Prismarine. Oh, thank you, sir. Six, six diamonds. Oh, here's your here's your barrel back if you want it. Uh, and your sign back if you want it. And more sugar, because it's so sweet. When he shows up, Beef is looking a little blue. But he has every reason to be happy with his spaceship, the outer shell of which is now taking shape above an increasingly more realistic crater. He gets the desire for a cartoon UFO out of his system by building a mini shop to get rid of some excess materials, and even gets to turn a villager into an alien in the process. But after adding thrusters to the ship's exterior and outfitting the cargo hold with stylish red shulker boxes, he visits the savannah to pay Iskal for the Prismarine deal, and receives a bronze wing medal after a somewhat confusing guided tour. Here's a question, how the heck do I get back up to the portal quickly from here because- Oh, I'll show you. Okay. Go into this water stream, we oh. tied up here. Oh, dang it. And finally, there's Mumbo, who continues the naturalization of his armchair mountain with moss, leaves, and renewed confidence. Now that I've logged in and I'm just following what I've already done, it is a lot smoother and a lot faster. And he adds a waterfall down the center, pausing only to tweak its course down the mountainside, and rewards himself by adopting a steed which is definitely a horse no matter what the government says. He's actually got quite the inventory on him. <laughs> I fit in a wide body kit to my horse. His methods continue to trend unconventional when he starts mining for ancient debris using end crystals, which would have been a roaring success had he not then attempted to kill a ghast with one as well. I've just, <laughs> I've just unraveled some ancient debris. What? Following the Botum Town Bouncy Llama meeting, Mumbo finds himself ejected into the void by a mischievous misclick by Good Times with Scar, and vows to make sure this doesn't happen again, installing an enderpearl stasis chamber that Grian will surely sabotage at some point. It's at least foolproof enough for now that he can demonstrate it to any number of his server mates, basically making this the prestige, but they're all the man in the tank. And safe in the knowledge that his gear won't be lost to the void for now, Mumbo upgrades to Netherite. And that's about it for this week's recap. Our writer is Loy XP, and my name is Pixel Rives. In the end screen theatre today, you can check out our writer's own survival Minecraft series, where he essentially invents the concept of spite mining. And no, I will not elaborate on what any of that actually means. Just click on the video. The guy works very hard and needs more eyeballs on his channel. Don't forget to leave a like while you're still here, and subscribe so you won't miss future recaps. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.